This is going to be amazing. You got a lot of people on this call today. I think the biggest miss that people make in Thank terms of so selling it. And that's what a good marketing message, good it's brand about is done. How does somebody do something big in a very short period of time? We're going to pass the mic over right now to the man of the hour, Vern Harnish. He is the author of the best selling book, Scaling Up. He's the founder of EO Entrepreneur Organization. He is just a complete heavy hitter, probably one of the most connected people in entrepreneurship. So Vern, thank you so much for taking the time. I am very grateful to have you on right now. Well, Bill, thank you so much for this opportunity to share some ideas. And I was thinking about this presentation last night. I wanted to open up with a story and it's about the late T. Boone Pickens. Many of you guys might have known and followed him. You know, he made his hundreds of millions in the oil and gas industry. And then he essentially lost it all at the turn of the century. He started kind of the year 2000 broke. Now I've gotten two different numbers. It was from him, either 2.8 or 3.2 million he had left. For some of us, that might be a good number, but he had lost hundreds of millions. He's in his seventies and he's like, all right, what haven't I learned? Because look, we're here to talk about winning. At the end of the day, you want to win and your clients want you to win. And it is about winning. And as I learned from Joe, you're either winning or learning. And so T Boone in the 70s said, what haven't I learned? And so he goes out and he looks for the answer. First, he found it. All he did was change one daily routine. And look, our success is just the sum total of what we do more of, less of, or different every day, us and our teams. And he made this one daily change and the rest of the story is history. He turned that 3.2 million into 4 billion over the next 72 months. And the reason I love the story is first, he didn't hit his first billion until he was in his seventies. So some of us still have time. And he then wrote a book called The First Billion is the Hardest. And trust me, having talked to many billionaires, once you get that first billion, the second, third, and fourth are just so much easier. So Bill, we just have to get everybody here to that first billion and they're going to be okay. And what is it that he discovered? And it comes back to what is the most important tool, weapon, if you would, in the information age, and it's right between our ears. And he looked at what is the key capability of the brain that's tied to super success. By the way, in any field, including for Tom Brady at the Super Bowl here a couple of days ago. And that capability is pattern recognition. That's all we are is pattern recognition machines. And after you've done something for the proverbial 10,000 hours, you begin to burn that those patterns into the very muscle and brain fiber of your body. And you can make the split second decisions because look, victory comes down to inches, seconds, words, and that's the space that you play in. The reason it's so difficult is you're dealing with people. And the one thing we know is people are not logical, they are psychological. And I wanna come back on a couple of book recommendations. So first he said, look, it's about pattern recognition. The second thing he discovered is, and now that we can watch the brain in real time, whenever you're sitting around thinking about what it is that you have to do, particularly something really difficult. What's interesting from a paleo perspective, which we can't change for 200,000 years, your reptilian brain lights up like a Christmas tree and either men, we want to punch, you know, run at or run from. The feminine has a much healthier, which is flock, but it's not a great place to think when you're trying to think your way through it. It's interesting. 100,000 years ago, we developed this thing called speech. And when you watch the brainwave scans, we're a being that needs to talk our way through issues and ideas and solutions. And so what he saw is the minute you begin to speak about the challenge, and that's why being in, in community together and having an opportunity to share is so powerful. Your amygdala shuts down, your prefrontal lobes light up like a Christmas tree and you can begin to solve the problem. So taking these two ideas that it's about pattern recognition and that's what experience provides you, particularly if you're getting lots of different experiences, not just one year done 20 times for 20 years, combined to the fact that what is the only way wars and markets have ever been won and lawsuits to Intel. Whoever has the best first hand, not second, third or fourth hand, whoever has the first best first hand Intel has always won. I just finished the Apple Plus 
series uh, Tehran. And again, another you know, base story based on the fact that it was Intel that determines whether you're gonna win or lose. And so given all this together, here's what T. Boone did. 5.35 a.m. Every morning, two analysts came in and began to scour the internet and the network that they have for what's happened in the last 24 hours in particularly their industry. And if you don't think things are changing every 24 hours with your case, with the situation, with what is going on uh, in the dynamic of a particular case, then your head's really in the sand. Then at 6.15 sharp, he would call these analysts on his way to his workout. And he lived up until 9-11, 2019, to a ripe age of 91. Actually did a, took on Obama in a physical challenge. He was 30 years his junior, such great shape. And he would have a 15 minute call, conversation with these two analysts. What did you learn? What did you pick up? What are you hearing? What do you, and he would then ask questions back, gather more intel in that particular area. And then he would quiet his mind. And from 6.30 to 7.30, which is why meditation, which we saw in the book Principles and others, some of the, the folks that are really understanding brain power have gotten into really meditation once or twice a day. In that kind of meditative state while he's working out his muscles, his mind is beginning to look for the patterns. What did he just hear compared to yesterday, last week, and his gazillion years of experience? And then at 7.30 sharp every morning, he had breakfast with his senior team, two egg white omelets, so he didn't have to bother ordering, was just delivered. And for 25 minutes, he and his senior team would get talk time around what was going on in the market, deals that they were wanting to do, moves that they wanted to make next. And then at eight o'clock, they'd hit it hard, just like you are. Then at the end of the day, after doing battle, they would get back in the room and do a review. All right, what worked, what didn't work? We either won or we're learning, winning or learning. And that was it. That routine is what allowed him to turn 3.2 million into 4 billion. I had no idea you were going to go there. I thought we were going to go into the four principles of scaling up. And I'm happy you did because I've been saying for a couple of months now that they're the top culture driver of a company, aside from weekly meetings, because we see a lot of power from them. My question is, why do people look at meetings as unproductive? In short, that daily is short. We're talking about when I was at Steelcase to celebrate the 20th anniversary of them implementing my tools as they took a $4 billion factory with 12 million square feet down to a million doing that same 4 billion. Unbelievable productivity gain over the last two decades. So I was there last January and I got to watch how twice a day at both shifts, that daily huddle is seven minutes. And look, we're talking about a restroom break. And if it's done right, it is the largest ROI that you can have. Every minute you're in that daily saves you 10. So their seven minute saves everyone about an hour, which is a massive amount of productivity. But I wanted to understand between my first book, the one that Gino used to scale his company. And he, again, taught our tools exclusively till he went on his own entrepreneurial way till my book scaling up, I wanted to understand why people stopped it. And I came down to one word, generalities versus specifics. If I'm saying, hey, what's up today? Hey, I'm working on another case, just like I do every day, you know, end the meeting now. But what I wanna do is activate the most important sense we ever had as humans, and that's hearing. We could hear the beast way before we could see them, smell them, or they were tasting us probably instead of us tasting them. And so the ability to hear Real names, real numbers, real people, real situations is what allows us to begin to put those patterns together that give us an edge over the competition. So it's the importance of sharing specifics instead of generalities in that seven minute daily huddle. The most important agenda item is where people are stuck. That's what Goldman goes to facts when they do their daily, you know, what's blocking me? What's in my way? of moving a case forward or a deal forward or whatever it is. And people are like, but I only want to share that if I think somebody can help me and somebody probably can't. They miss it. 90% of the value is having a place, a safe place, hopefully, a healthy place, as Pat Lanchoni would call it, where you can verbalize your deepest, darkest fears and concerns. And how many times, Bill, has it happened to you where you haven't talked to somebody for months, you verbalize their name in a conversation and all of a sudden you get a text from them in a few minutes. I was just thinking about you. It's real. 
when we put these vibrations of our voice out and we ask for what it is we need. That's the benefit here. And those are some of the deep things that we go into the power. And if you want to move faster, you pulse faster. What, what I'm curious on is when you want to scale a company, can you do it on profit? And how would you suggest a business not only scales in revenue, but also in tandem with profit? Well, two things. I, I really think we as firms should do to ourselves what others do to dramatically increase the value. So Danaher buys companies like ours, and they're brilliant at two things, top grading, getting the right butts in the right seats, and their process fiends. I want to throw a number out, and then I'll, I'll answer your question more directly. The average revenue per employee of the global 500, these big, bureaucratic global companies is almost a half a million dollars. The average for us mere mortal mid-market companies, 5 million to a billion, is 126,000. We're one-fourth as productive in generating a dollar per employee as the global 500. And why is that? Because the second place that we're really weak is process. We get so focused on getting our functions right, marketing and, and operations and the like, that we forget that our clients and even our team experience the organization through a set of horizontal processes. The short answer is we've got to get much more focused on process than throwing people at the situation. And look, there's only two reasons people quit companies. You make me work with dumb people and you make me do stupid things. And so if you can fix the people and the process side of the organization, you're going to be able to move forward. Now, to your second question about growing on profit, PE firms, though, leverage every dollar of equity with generally $2 of debt. And I actually think we need to up our sophistication as entrepreneurs in how to use debt in a proper way in order to really pour fuel on the fire. But what we've learned is you don't want to do that till you've got your business model worked out. Otherwise, you're just going to speed up a mess. But once you've got the machine well-oiled, now pour all the fuel on you can. I'm going out to get another 600 grand of SBA loans just to pour fuel on a new tech platform. I don't want to give equity away. It's the most expensive dollar you can raise. And my partner, John, scaled to 24 locations, all with bank debt. And so it's some of the cheapest money that you can get if you use it responsibly. What is the top principle that you tell service-based businesses to scale revenue? First, to get a leader. What's interesting, one of the very first law firms I worked with out of Dallas had five principles, each owned 20%. And when you ask them our face question, function accountability chart, who's head of the organization? They like stuff five initials into that box. The point is nobody was running the company. On the flip side, one of our top law firm clients, they're actually in the divorce space. The lead lawyer doesn't do any legal work. He actually is CEO of the company versus being just a practice with a whole bunch of lawyers in it. And so that's the first thing is to actually get completed our face tool, function accountability chart, get who's head of the organization, who's head of sales. And if you really want to drive sales, you know, it's critical. The number one function to scale is actually marketing and marketing is not glorified sales support. And the thing that I learned from Regis McKenna, the marketing guru that taught Intel and Genentech and Steve Jobs, how to scale and me, I was one of his early clients back in 1983 when I was getting ready to scale YEO globally, which we did first, you have to have a one hour separate marketing meeting, separate from sales. And that's the place, the space where you can work on all of this stuff that you're teaching around how to market and drive sales. Finally, you know, Steve Jobs only chaired one function, even though he had the title ICEO, his only function he chaired was marketing, a three hour meeting every Wednesday afternoon. Tim Cook, his number two, what well, then did everything else. So when Steve passed, it was easy to toss the ball over to Tim because he was really the head of the company, even though by title, Steve was CEO. And our view is marketing strategy equals strategy. Marketing makes sure you go for profit share, not market share, that you want profit share. You know, when Apple had its highest market cap, they only had 7% market share, but they owned 50% of the profit of the industry. 
And marketing's job is to find you the right opportunities. You can't expect sales to do that. Sales will hit any one they can sell. They just need to hit. So marketing disciplines sales. And so to that, the most powerful tool I've ever used, we just taught it to Steve Jobs, Intel, Genentech, and me back in 83, is the importance of taking that piece of paper out and making a list of the top 25 relationships, if not 250, you need to nurture in your local or global market. I saw that with John Fisher and his relationship with the judges and the mediators and all of that. And those relationships, because these are humans, they're not automatons and relationship matters. And I want you to make that list. I want you, the number one thing, KPI, I believe, is the amount of talk time, not email time, the amount of talk time and connection you maintain with that group. So to me, the word company means to share bread. And I know we're in this weird time, but since September, I have made it a point to break bread with my list on the road almost every week. Because this is the time when everyone's zigging, you want to zag. And this ability to connect and maintain the relationships with the influencers in your market is your number one, two, and three job as the leader of your particular law firm.